Doug Vermalm is co-founder and the CEO of Stable. Stable is an MGA that focuses on ensuring and providing tools for vehicle owners in the mobility economy. Um, Doug, welcome. Hey, Dan. Glad Thanks to have you here. On. Thanks for having me. Well, first off, I think the first thing I'm wondering after, I mean, I've, I've heard you guys for quite some time, but what people may be wondering is what exactly do you mean by the mobility economy? I mean, people think of Uber and Lyft, but it, I, I have a sense it's broader than that. Yeah. So I think what we're seeing, so Uber and Lyft definitely were, were the start of what we consider to be the new mobility economy. Um, so kind of moving away from kind of the older way commercial auto uh, was done, right? So you usually bought a vehicle or you had a fleet uh, for a very specific purpose. You had, um, in, in a lot of instances, a human doing the logistics, right? You call in to you know, a, um, a trucking center and they'd tell you where to go or a dispatch center if you were a, you know, a black car fleet and um, tell you to pick up so-and-so at the airport at a certain time. And, and that's kind of changed now, especially in the rideshare space where it's all done um, you know, via computers now, right? Via AI, um, the logistics centers are set up uh, via Uber and Lyft and, and the algorithms that they've kind of placed, the matching algorithms. And we've started to see that bleed over into other parts of uh, commercial mobility. So um, pandemic, uh, you, you saw uh, delivery really take off. Uh, you've started to see these small fleets of uh, rental vehicles uh, pop up uh, through Turo and and get around. Uh, and I think we're just kind of at the beginning of what this is going to look like. Um, I think we're going to start seeing it bleed over into the trucking space, which isn't something that we're, we're super interested in. Um, you know, th there's a wide variance of commercial auto. I think people kind of throw it all together um, when it comes to insurance. But there's, there's a lot of different segments uh, that people focus on. Uh, so we're focused more on, on the smaller vehicles. Um, so last mile delivery, uh, commercial, uh, sorry, um, ride share, uh, car share, mm -hmm. things like that. And um, I'm, the next 10 years, I think you're going to see a lot of new types of use come uh, come into play from uh, kind of these shared use of vehicles and algorithmic program logistics rather than human-based logistics. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, so I'm looking at this, um, I mean, according to your LinkedIn, you started this in 2018. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So we, um, it was okay. born out of a, sorry. It was born yeah, well, out of what I was wondering is, <laughs> yeah, sorry, a little leg there. Um, it was born out of a fleet of vehicles that we had uh, doing rideshare in New York City, uh, and we couldn't solve our own insurance problem uh, at the time. So the fleet started in 2014. Um, really, we're trying. We, we had put a lot of technology into the vehicles uh, to allow for us to understand who was or how, how they were being driven by the people that we were renting out to. And we were trying to give that to our insurer and they, they had no way to one collect the data and then actually to use it um, in their underwriting models. Uh, and so we, we realized that this was a problem, not just for our fleet, but for a lot of other fleets in the space. And then a lot of individual owner operators as well had the same problem uh, where they were paying for some safety features in their vehicle and not really realizing the benefit from the, from their insurers. And so we set out to actually um, solve that problem for ourselves and then uh, solve it for the market overall. Wow. So you really understood this problem. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing your story. My first thought is that like, you're just, you know, talking with your Uber driver one night and found out, Hey, there's an insurance opportunity here. You took, you, you were way deeper into it than that. Yeah. You so were, the, were ride here. yeah. Talking to the Uber driver happened back in 2011 when, when Uber came to New York. So I, I was not the first user of Uber in New York, but I was definitely uh, kind of in the, in the, the first percentile there um, where I, I don't know how I happened upon it, uh, but I loved, like I couldn't find cabs ever in, in New York. Um, so don't want to um, talk about what I was doing, but like, you know, late night uh, bar hopping, whatever, whatever it might be. And you kind of had like the bars would close and then all of a sudden there'd be a rush for cabs and you would be the best option that usually has like a gypsy cab that would come and they, they negotiated the rate at that point, they'd be like $60 to go 20 blocks. Uh, and all of a sudden Uber showed up and you had access on demand access for vehicles in the city, which was really interesting. Uh, and so I just started talking to a lot of these drivers. I used it way more than I should have probably. Um, but come to find out that a lot of them were renting. So a lot of immigrants would come in uh, to the city uh, and it would be a great job for them uh, as they started. So uh, no education needed to do it. Um, a lot of times you could use your foreign driver's license to start working, uh, you know, whether it was in a black car company or Uber and Lyft uh, or Uber just at that time. 
Uh, and so that was, it was a great way for, for immigrants to make money. Um, the problem was in New York, uh, anyway, the, the, the cost of insurance is quite high. Uh, so typically these policies would cost anywhere between four and $5,000 a year. That's if you're a perfect driver. Um, usually it was probably closer to eight or nine if you were an immigrant driver with no U.S. record. Um, and then there's the licensing aspect. So you have to get the car license with the Taxi and Limousine Commission uh, in the city. Um, that, and then you're not even talking about the cost of the vehicle itself. So um, it's often easier to get a car loan than to get the, you know, you couldn't borrow money to do the other parts of the, the insurance and the regulatory aspect. So, so a lot of people just rented um, and there's a lot of predatory uh, renting that was going on. Uh, and so our, our whole guide, like the, the reason we started it, um, other than wanting to have kind of a side gig, um, was we thought we could offer a better product and a better experience for, for people coming in and using uh, Uber, or driving for Uber and Lyft for the very first time. Okay. And then how, um, how did you get your product discovered? I mean, how do you, how do you find the customers? How do they connect to you? When, when we had the fleet? Oh, I'm in now when you're. Oh, now. About yeah. Food yeah. So we use a couple of different methods. So we're not, we're not the type of uh, insure tech, I think, where we say, um, brokers are, are not the way forward. I think that anybody who did that has quickly a uh, reverse course and said, no, we, we do need brokers to be a part of um, our distribution strategy. We feel the same way, uh, especially when it comes to fleets. Uh, there's often other insurance needs that we're not interested in, in covering at this point, whether it's um, workman's comp or general liability or whatever it might be, um, that it makes sense to have a broker kind of be a part of that experience uh, and offer different types of coverage um, or just explain our coverages to those uh, to those insureds. Um, when it comes to individual owner operators, um, we found direct is, is the best way to be very clear. Like our MGA product, uh, is, is just launching in Illinois. So this is a little bit ex experimental for us. Um, I think we're going to find the right mix uh, as we go forward. Um, but then the third channel that we're looking at is, is just trying to work with, uh, other trusted voices in the community. Um, so we have, um, one of our investors and advisors, a guy named Harry Campbell, he started uh, Harry the Rideshare Guy. I think it's just called the Rideshare Guy now, which is kind of a, a media operation uh, to give advice to to drivers. Um, so either first time drivers or just kind of a community um, where drivers can trade war stories and tips and advice and things like that. Um, so we started working with him early on uh, and he's helped us kind of become a trusted voice in, in the community. Uh, but then we, we go out and identify other groups and there's usually um, some different groups in each city that you go to. So there's like the IDG, um, the International Drivers Guild, which is growing uh, in a few different cities. Uh, New York, they're most prominent, but they're, they're in Chicago as well and a few others. Um, but then there's also like, so Chicago, for instance, is a group called Legal Rideshare, uh, which is just trying to look out for um, issues that drivers have, whether they were involved in an accident and they can't get in payment from their insurance company um, or from, from the third party insurance company. Uh, or if they get deactivated by Uber and Lyft, they try and help out to get the, the user um, activated again, the driver right. activated. Um, so that's another trusted community that we're going to and just trying to do cool marketing uh, to try to understand how we can best serve the interests of those drivers. Um, these drivers, I'll say, are very finicky. Um, they've, they have not been in the best position uh, from, let, let's say, Uber and Lyft uh, mostly, but others have tried to take advantage of this driver group as well. Um, so a new entrant comes in, they're very cautious about working with you. Uh, so we knew that one of the things we'd have to do right off is just try to gain a trusted foothold with other people that were already in the space, other organizations that had already built up some trust. So that's, that's a large part of what we're doing as well. Okay. Well, let's rewind a little bit. Um, we dove right into the thick of it there. Um, I'm kind of curious, uh, so we understand how you got the idea because you were in fleet. Then, um, tell me about the, um, the, the founding team and kind of how that came together in those, those, those early days where you discovered something was possible here. Yeah, I, I still feel like, very lucky, pinch myself um, almost every day with the team that we've been able to put together, um, how I convinced them to go out and do this. I'm, I'm still not quite sure. Um, so Stephen Decker was the first person that joined me, uh, one of the co-founders. Uh, he heads our, our, uh, he's our product lead right now. Um, he was one of the investors with me in, uh, in, that, uh, in that fleet of vehicles that we had. 
Um, so th- that fleet was just a, a side gig that I had. I was I used to be an attorney at uh, Mercer, uh, one of the Marsh McLennan companies. I was just looking for a way to kind of create a little additional income uh, on the side wow. uh, in, in New York. Realized very quickly it was it was a much larger uh, undertaking than than I had realized. A um, lot of lot of interesting stories from from the the fleet picking up cars in random places that people would abandon. Um, so Stephen joined me, um, you know, it was really just, we were looking at New York uh, in particular. Uh, we saw a huge opportunity there. Um, it's probably still the largest single market uh, for Uber and Lyft uh, in the U.S. Um, I mean, California is probably bigger, but um, as far as just an individual city, uh, it it's, has to be uh, the, the number one uh, spot still in the U.S. Um, large premium market uh, for the size of what it was. And so, and, and, and it's the... The two carriers that kind of dominate the space, they're they're good carriers, um, but they just they're not large enough where they have like an innovation budget. Um, potentially good clients for 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 Socotra. You might want to look into them. Happy to make mm-hmm. connections for you guys. Um, awesome. But they they just you know they they've been around for thirty or forty years. Um, they're run by people in the taxi industry uh, in, the, in the transportation industry in New York. Um, not very technology focused though, and, and not to their fault. It's just, that's kind of the way they had been set up. Um, and so we saw an opportunity to come in and just try and compete with them. Um, eventually we became a digital broker for one of them. Uh, so mm-hmm. they, they saw the need to, to innovate as well. Uh, they just couldn't do it on their own. Um, but yeah, so I convinced Steven just, just off of New York, uh, we saw that opportunity, um, and neither of us were truly insurance people, um. I was more of a technology orientated uh, attorney, but not um, not on the insurance side. Stephen was from um, automated manufacturing plants, um, being a product manager there. Uh, him and I met like 20 years ago working at, a, at another startup. Um, so we'd known each other for a long time, but neither of us were insurance guys. Uh, and so we knew right away we we're going to have to go out and find people, um, at, at least from an advisor perspective, to offer us mm-hmm. advice and tell us how to how to speak to reinsurers, how to speak to carriers, um, all the different parts of you know what makes up an MGA, successful distribution strategy, things like that. Um, and so we we did a good job bringing those advisors on, but really couldn't find a third co-founder uh, to bring on from an insurance perspective. And and I think that's the we we went out for about two years, about a year and a half, um, talking to reinsurers, trying to build um, you know, build the case for our product, and and we didn't get anywhere with it. Um, and so finally, we we convinced one of our advisors to come on as a as a third co-founder, a guy named John Salvucci, uh, former underwriter AIG, ran his own independent agency for about a decade. Uh, just a guy that is an all around utility player in the insurance space. Um, Brought him on, and we closed like our first digital distribution deal um, with with one of our um, one of those New York carriers. Uh, and still, we're kind of working on the the national MGA. COVID slowed that down a little bit, um, but um, we we were able to uh, make a deal with a company called Resolute Global, which used to be called ILS Capital Management, uh, and that's where we um, that's who we're launching this first Illinois product with. Uh, along the way, we've just added on team members, so we we were at three. Uh, full time, so the three co-founders, um, pretty much through the end of 2020, we had one engineer who joined us. So him and I wow. were kind of working on the product together. Um, and then um, once we got our first investment, which was uh, mid 2021, uh, so not quite a year ago, uh, that's when we really started adding on team members. Um, so we brought on yeah. a director of operations um, from uh, from another fintech. Uh, so she had helped kind of build that company into a Series A and Series B uh, company. So great experience uh, from from Tiffany coming in and helping us think about our trajectory going forward there. Uh, brought in a head of claims um, from James River, a guy named Dylan Brand, um, genius guy when it comes to rideshare claims. So James River used to do, I think they were the first insurer that kind of picked up uh, Uber uh, back in back in 2010 or 2011. Um, and then um, he's probably seen more rideshare claims, I like to think, than anybody else in the U.S. And so he knows kind of where the bodies are buried and the mistakes that have been made and how to improve upon that. In fact, he, he gives a lot of uh, advice on the product side as well, um, what we can do, what we can't do uh, from a claims perspective, um, and then how that kind of translates into features that we can offer to our to our insureds. Um, so those are, those are kind of like the key people that we're working with right now. We've brought on other engineers, uh, a guy named he- Evan, who's running our engineering department, um, brilliant hire. A um, couple of the utility players are just amazing. And so we're still a pretty small team. We have uh, a nine full time right now. Uh, mm-hmm. And we'll look to add on to that kind of as we uh, go into more states. But we've been really happy with with the talent that we have on so far. 
Wow. I'm amazed what you've got done with such a lean team, especially in those um, founder only days. Yeah. Um, you got, you got quite a ways with that. And then of course, lockdown hits. Um, yeah. What was that like for you guys in the, I don't know, three, four months after lockdown started in terms of, um, well, uh, not too many people were getting into Ubers. Yeah. We're afraid of getting diseases, getting COVID and stuff like that. Um, where did you think things were going? And then like, how did, how did that shake out? Yeah. So we had just, I think in 20, so what was it? Late 2019, we signed our first, um, uh, digital distribution deal, our, our distribution deal as a, as a broker, uh, with a company named Hereford out of New York. Um, we had, we launched the product. So we had, we had built kind of like this internal, um, uh, digital rating engine that kind of mimicked their rater and we could then give online quotes and bind and then kind of like the back end was much more manual, but at least from the front end, it looked like things were happening from a, from an automated perspective. And, um, I think we launched on February 13th, uh, 2020 with a rideshare product. So about a month out from full lockdown in, in New York, mm -hmm. uh, and we had great sales, oh, things wow. were looking really good. And then, and then, yeah, lockdown happened. And so, um, that ended up killing that deal for us. We just, there wasn't really a way for us to move forward um, and focus on the digital distribution part of things with, with a brokerage. Um, and uh, yeah, into 2020, I think we were looking at like, is there a way for us to sell off some of this IP that we've created? Um, you know, would it make sense for us to maybe get bought wholesale by, by the, um, uh, by the carrier that we were working with? We were exploring a couple different options. Um, and then we started talking, I guess this is early 2021, we started talking with Resolute Global and really saw a path forward there to launch a national product. Also by then, I think people were starting to feel comfortable that the, the vaccine would be widely distributed at a certain point. There definitely was going to be ups and downs. I think we saw that in 2021 uh, with lockdowns and new, new variants. And I'm not 100% sure we're out of the woods yet. Um, things seem to be going yeah. well. Um, we have a lot of other problems going on in the world, but, but at least COVID seems yeah. to be somewhat tamed. Um, yeah, so it, I think that you know, we kind of talk about like how long we stay in and try and do things. And what if we had given up like a month before, or even like a week before, or even a day before, uh, what would that look like? Um, and yeah, there's, there's definitely times I think you're doing this for that long. Um, startups are tough anyway, but I think in the insured tech space, they're double or triply tough just because you're working with a partner. Uh, if you're an MGA, you're working with a partner anyway, that you have to convince that you have a good product that you can sell. Yeah. trying to raise money um just like any startup does but you're also dealing with like the regulatory aspect which can be quite difficult um so we would hmm. the the difficult conversations we'd have with reinsurers we had the same difficult conversations with the dfs in new york the regulatory body in new york that that does insurance hmm. to try to convince them like this is the way forward this is how things need to be if you want to have a good product in the space which they were looking for and those aren't always easy conversations to have so um there's definitely days where like why the hell are we doing this like where we're going to keep going on um, but now I think we're very thankful that we did now that we've kind of, kind of gotten out of the tunnel mm -hmm. and, and we're starting to see kind of the, the forward momentum that we need to actually deliver the product to our customers that we told them we could deliver. And you mentioned New York, where you said you're starting in Illinois. Yeah. So New York, New York, I think is, it's a, that would be, we'd love to get into New York at some point. Yeah. Yeah. I think both from, I heard, the, I heard the same New York's, New York's a tough one to get started with. You probably yeah. make that like your, you know, eighth or ninth state at best. Yeah. So it's when I, when we would go to reinsure straight up, it would, they, they kind of look at us and say, okay, this is, this is interesting. I think the gap, the data you guys have gathered is interesting. So we, we took a lot of data from, from the fleet. So the, one of the big things that we did with the fleet was, um, so it, it all came from like, we were having a lot of drivers abandon vehicles or not pay us. And so Uber started making data available um, on certain uses. So you could, you could apply to get access to their API and start pulling certain information from drivers. So we started doing that just from a credit modeling uh, perspective. Like, is this driver earning enough that we're going to be comfortable to rent our vehicle out to him and not have this person be a problem from a payment perspective? Uh, and it improved, it improved our, um, our payment rate um, a little bit. Uh, but it was just a really interesting experiment to say, hey, like there's this data available that nobody else is using at this point. Fintechs weren't really using it yet. Um, insurers definitely weren't using it yet, from a, at least from an individual perspective. Um, some of the larger ENS carriers, I think, were, um, but not in a real time basis either. It was always like um, backwards looking. Um, and so, yeah, it was just kind of like coming from that fleet where we realized like we could we could make this this difference in the insurance product. Um, and yeah, that, that's kind of how it all started. 
Hmm. Okay. Then how did you get thinking about, uh, you, you mentioned delivery. So I obviously we see the similarity between they're both, you know, kind of gig workers driving things around, either driving people or driving stuff. Um, is it really that similar to move into delivery I w- or do they have completely separate organizations and economics and culture and such? The, so the setup is similar and same with car share where you kind of have this concept of on platform or off platform ride share is a little bit more nuanced and there's several levels to, to whether you're on or off um, several in between stages. Um, but there, there's usually another insurer involved on, on the platform, right? So whether it's Uber and Lyft's captive, and there's still other insurers involved, even you know, now that they have captives. Um, same with Turo and Get Around. There's there's an ENS uh, cap or ENS uh, carrier um, playing somewhere within that space. Uh, and same on the delivery side. So um, you have like companies like Y Risk and and iBot from Apollo. Um, and then the large players like Liberty Mutual and Allstate, like they're involved from a commercial aspect on those platforms. And so this is concept of like there is somebody else covering that risk um, on on platform. Um, but the vehicle, the underlying vehicle itself still needs an insurance policy to get the car registered and for all the personal driving or kind of like in between driving that's going to take place. Um, and that, that's where stable plays. Like we actually offer that that vehicle, uh, the, the policy, um, typically men limits is what's required or what, what most drivers take. Um, and we offer that. Um, we try and play nicely with whomever is on the other side of the platform. Um, now, the risks are obviously very different, um, sometimes from a, um, a state mandated perspective. So um, rideshare has been around longer. It's been regulated a little bit longer um, to get rideshare live in a lot of states. Uber may Uber and Lyft make concessions with those states to what those limits would be. So they're often a million dollars. Um, they have much higher limits than that in, in a lot of instances. Uh, but at a minimum, you need a million dollars to kind of conduct this type of activity uh, in, in that state. Um, delivery is much lower and that, that kind of makes sense, right? There's then a passenger in the vehicle. It's, it's a can of noodles or something that's being delivered. Um, so nobody's going to get as hurt. Um, at least a third party is not going to get as hurt, um, in, in that instance. So those limits are lower. I, I think it's also an aspect of just, there hasn't been a massive accident that's take pl- taken place, um, like in the rideshare space to, to cause people mm-hmm. to say, I need to have these large limits in place, or I'm not going to allow you to operate in my jurisdiction. Um, Car share is a little bit different in that that type of activity has been around for a long time, right? People have been renting cars for for quite a while. I don't know how long, but decades. Um, and so the the infrastructure is there. Like, hey, like if you want to operate in our state as a rental car company, these are the types of limits that you need to have in place. And these are, you know, this is what we need to show from an insurance perspective. But now it's like, how do we how do we actually know that that customer is in the car? Because this is a it's not somebody that's picking up a car from from the airport. Um, out of an Ava slot and there's like a kind of corporate responsibility about like who's who's driving and you got like corporate logs so you can hand over to a regulator. Uh, it's Turo or Lyft, which is trying to manage probably, mm-hmm. I think at last count, there was 85,000 individual fleets um, or sometimes fleets of one uh, on Turo. Um, and how do you like hand that over to a regulator to say like, yes, all the correct taxes are being paid and the correct insurance is in place. So it's a little bit more difficult. Um, so I think those there's going to be some interesting things that come about from a regulatory perspective that might change the insurance dynamic. Um, and that's where you actually have to be very flexible um, to say, hey, like we can change this very quickly if need be, if a regulatory rule changes. So our policy is still effective in the case that that happens. OK, then um, let me go back a little further. You, you mentioned you mentioned your, your I mean, you've got a JD and you, you actually practice law. Um, how did, how did you go from that to entrepreneurship? I'm kind of curious, you know, tell me a little bit more about Doug. What, yeah, what, so, what, what happened there? You've done a lot of things. I also see yeah. some consulting and a lot of mentoring. I yeah. Know, I so, so it, it was actually the, the opposite. It was, it was, I went from entrepreneurship to legal and then realized that was not the right move. And so right, that makes even less sense. sense. So you're an <laughs> entrepreneur who just says, yeah, I think I'm going to go to law school. Yeah. So entrepreneur in the sense that I worked for a startup. Um, I didn't start the startup. Um, I was I was employee number one. So kind of I, anybody who started with us early, still anybody who comes on board, I feel like is taking very similar risks to what we've taken. Maybe they're not inputting capital, but they're definitely saying, hey, like 
I believe in this a lot and I, I feel like this is going to go the distance. Otherwise I wouldn't, you know, I'd, I'd go get market salary and, and I can probably work for um, a much further along tech company. Um, and that, that's going to give me um, closer to market and, and the same amount of equity that I would get from stable. So, uh, that, and that's where Steven and I met Steven Decker, the, one of the other co-founders and I, we met at this startup. Uh, it's kind of a consulting slash, um, it might be called a fintech now. Um, that's the kind of how I refer to it. So we were doing consulting, uh, financial uh, modeling for uh, trust departments. So coming in and kind of helping them uh, do portfolio analysis for all of their accounts. And actually, some of the some of the technology aspect of it was we could do it for very small accounts. So back in the early aughts, it wasn't common for like a fifteen thousand dollar IRA to have a portfolio manager involved doing portfolio analysis. We were kind of doing this fund of fun things would make that possible. So you could have a fifteen thousand dollar IRA and have some some portfolio analysis taking place. Um, so that's what I was working on. Um, in fact, uh, the the founder of that company he's now on our cap table. He's, we've stayed good friends. He's a mentor of mine, a great guy. Um, and he, I mean, I remember I remember the day I went and said I'm going to quit and I'm going to go work for this law firm. So I didn't go to be a lawyer. Um, I think I was just looking for something new. Wanted to do something a bit different. Um, I had the opportunity to work um, as a consultant for uh, for a law firm working on a, an antitrust case, so kind of using my economic background, uh, econ degree to do basically teaching lawyers about economic theory so they could um, depose people correctly. So they use, they were like going and deposing like Kenneth Chenault of Amex and other high profile um, financiers. And uh, I was just kind of giving them prep on notes and things like that. I enjoyed that aspect of it. I enjoyed working on a big case in a law firm. Uh, it's probably closest to what you see in, in TV and the movies about working <laughs> internally at a law firm. Most people do not do that. Like 99% like of the people that work in law, that's not the, the experience they have. And I realized that after, after I went to law school. Did you school, make it into a courtroom? Uh, no, I was, I was a corporate attorney. Uh, so I worked on contracts and IP agreements, uh, data security agreements, things like that. Um, and I, I love the team. Like I loved Mercer. I love the team that I worked with, but it just, it wasn't what I should have been working on. Um, and so I was actively looking for things to do. And that's kind of how I started the fleet. Uh, and then realized like, Hey, there's more to this fleet, um, from an insurance perspective. And I think I have enough of the connections that I need that I can go out and actually do this. Wow. So you are highly versatile. I'm thinking here, like, well, frankly, I'm thinking how much how helpful it'd be for me to have a JD um, along the way in the early days when I'm trying to scrape my pennies together and my tier one law firm is selling is charging me a thousand dollars an hour. Yeah, and it would have been nice to <laughs> handle a couple of simple things. Yeah, it's, uh, it's I think in a highly regulated industry, right? Uh, it's nice to have that training and that background. Um, I try not to play lawyer anymore. Um, I think yeah. that can be very dangerous. But uh, yeah, when you're when you're trying to uh, conserve runway, um, it, those are places that it makes sense to cut corners or at least say, hey, like take a first look at this and tell me what you think before we go talk to our fifteen hundred dollar an hour attorney. Yeah, I think I think at some point you get almost like a I don't know a JD of hard knocks after making it to a certain size. But in those early days, the first time like you need to just come up with I don't know an NDA or a partnership or yep. reviewing a term sheet or or, or or what have you, you get this massive imposter syndrome yep. as a founder who, who 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 doesn't know these things that you got to bypass entirely. Yep. Um, thankfully, in the fundraising part, there's Brad Feld's book, which I highly recommend. I'm sure you've <laughs> this, seen yes. that one as well. You got, you got Brad Feld. You've, and you have so many people out there. Like, just I mean, you got to be careful what you read on Medium, I think, or on Twitter. But uh, there's oh, a no, lot of people got, that have gone. I got hardcover. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. No, it was um, one to me like when I was first getting started, and someone just like, just read this book. And I read it cover to cover in all the mind numbing detail. Actually, he's a pretty good writer considering the. Uh, but uh, you know, monotony of what he's got to cover. Right. But that was that was hugely helpful. Then uh, since you do some, men um, I understand you do some mentoring as well. Kind of curious how you got into that, and um, I that resonated with me. I was a lead mentor over at Startex, which is a, a an incubator in the Bay Area, and was a lead mentor to a whole bunch of startups. I'm kind of curious um, what your experience has been like there. Yeah. So I think when so when I 
when I went from being a lawyer to working and, you know, starting a startup, right, um, the, those networks are not similar. I think the people you know, the connections you have, the people you can get advice from, um, you go from a very risk averse uh, industry where like still, I think even to this day, there's people that I worked with, like, what the hell are you doing? Why are you doing this? You have, you have so you're talking job. about from risk averse industry <laughs> into insurance. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, the insure tech part, the, the, know, the more that. risky part. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. So right off the bat, like I tried to start making a new network um, to to understand like what it's going to be like to be a founder, understand people maybe two months, six months, a year, two, three, four years in front of me um, to see what they were dealing with. Um, I got lucky, like um, I people, you know, I think there's a, a lot of negative uh, emotion about WeWork. Um, there was a program at WeWork called WeWork Labs, uh, which I joined very early on um, and, and loved it. Like it was kind of a um, a non-equity dilutive um, way to to meet uh, people in the startup community. Um, so it's a bunch of I think there was we had like thirty early stage startups in one big room, um, all working kind of on the same stage of of company, um, all different industries obviously, but. Um, they would bring in like one week we'd have like a um, you know go to market expert the next week would be an investment expert the next week a PR expert uh, and then just meeting other people that you know would graduate from that or move on um, and get funding um, and then the people that actually ran the program um, still still some of my best friends and, and people that I go to for advice uh, found one of our early investors through that group um, so that was like a, um, a one year kind of training that I got um, just for, I think we paid like $450 for our desk or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we got on their Slack channel, we got all this benefit. Um, and I was like, well, I'm, I want to be able to like kind of provide that back. I feel like I, I asked a lot of that community of the New York City startup community and I got everything that I asked for. And just to walk away and not give anything back, I think would have been not, not the greatest move that a person could make. Um, so now I, I try and take every opportunity that I can get to talk to people about what they're working on, especially in the insure tech space. Um, we have great investors, uh, angel investors on our cap table that are always looking for deal flow. I feel like there's nothing better than an intro from another startup, um, especially yep. if that if that startup founder is willing to spend some time with you to help you kind of hone your pitch and help mm -hmm. you understand like what those people are looking for. Um, so yeah, I, now I try to take every opportunity to to help those people. Um, and it makes, it makes you look good as well, because like your investors are happy that you're bringing other good deals to them. Yep. Uh, so it, it's kind of like a, um, a everybody's happy uh, type yeah. situation. Yeah. I discovered that as well. I've been, um, as so many of our customers are insure techs. So I've been, um, you know, making introductions between them and my investors. And at first I thought the, I'd be like asking a favor, my investor, please check this out. And they're like, no, right. no, please send us more. So, right. That's been, that's been great. And then you do something like, I don't know, start a podcast to talk to, um, yep. <laughs> insure tech founders, you meet more <laughs> of them and it's just the, um, the, the value just keeps, you know, um, spiraling upward. Yep. So it's been, and it's been an amazing community, the insure tech community I've found. Uh, so are even was well, it people that are, you, you consider them competitors and, and even then I just feel like really the way everybody looks at it, at least in the insure tech community and insurance overall, like I don't want to put it like be like insure tech versus incumbents because anybody's willing to help. I think incumbents, mm -hmm. um, at least the people that work in them, they realize like, hey, you might be an acquisition target for them down the road. Um, they they want to make a good relationship with you to figure out like how, how they can get involved, either from a partnership perspective or acquisition perspective. Um, but insure techs, definitely, I feel like it is kind of this mentality of like, Hey, we're all kind of working against or trying to create value against an incumbent. Um, yeah. so even if you're like in the same space, um, you're usually not competing with that other insure tech, you're kind of competing against, you know, whether it's progressive or Geico or, or pick your, pick your incumbent. Um, and it's going to be a really good problem if five, 10 years from now, people in your space, you are heavily com uh, competitive because that means you guys are both very successful against the incumbent at that point, taking market share away. And I mean, I've found the same thing. It's, it's surprising collaborative, even amongst the incumbents, I've found that it's amazing how often I'm talking to an incumbent as uh, someone at an incumbent and they'll, they'll happily offer me an introduction to a colleague at a competitor. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Talk to this person. They'll, they'll love what the coach is doing. Yep. It's been, that's been surprising. Um, another thing I've found is even amongst the insure techs, 
it's not like they've got a big poster of you know, Allstate on a dartboard or something like that. And they're like, Mur, I hate that incumbent. They're, what what I hear them talk about, and, and I mean, as, as you mentioned in your intro, you're not, you don't have some, you know, competitor in your sites. What's in your sites is the problem that these drivers are facing. Mm-hmm. That's what I heard. That's what you started with. It's not a matter of, you know, we're going to take market sh- market share from these, you know, fat and lazy people. It's yep. we have drivers with a problem and they're not able to get the insurance they need, which means it's disastrous when something happens and so forth. And it's the, the, the stunting the ride share and um, mobile community and so forth. And I think that there's, um, I mean, there's not only virtue in that. But it also creates a fantastically collaborative, I, I shouldn't say creates, it's hand in hand with a fantastically collaborative community. Yep. And that's what's been fantastic for me about InsureTech. Yeah. So I was listening, you, you had um, the guy, I can't think of his name right now, but the guy from Seago, Seago on yeah, SIPO. Nestor. Yeah, yeah, Nestor. Uh, yeah. Great, great podcast. Yeah. Um, great company. And, you know, he, he said it very well, where it's like, you know, right now you're seeing just a lot of niche down MGAs. Um, and, it, and I think it, it, it's part of this, like incumbents, like it's the lowest common denominator. Like how the, they don't have time to go down or do they have the interest necessarily to go down into these niched uh, areas. And so they'll try and kind of like bolt, um, you know, something onto a policy that might help solve their policyholders needs. But they just can't do that at yeah. scale, nor, nor should they. Like that's not what they're really built for, and that's that's where insure techs can come in. I think provide a lot of value uh, to yeah. underserved or or misserved communities. Yeah, and the market is so darn big. If if you do not see it as an insure tech, it's not because of another insure tech. Right. right. That's what I've seen, or well, that seems to be the case. Self evidently, frankly. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Very cool. Um, so, um, when, for those precious moments, um, when you're not working on stable, what do you, what do you do with your time? Uh, well, I have a four and a two year old, so that does take up a lot of my time. Um, I would say I spend most of my time about it. Yeah. Well, I I try to spend most of my time convincing them to do the things that I'm interested in. I think it's like uh, a lot of fathers do that. Studying uh, law, underwriting. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, so right right now I'm trying to, I'm a big uh, Dutch soccer fan. So um, mm-hmm. my, my family uh, ancestrally is from uh, from the Netherlands. Um, so we're going to be in the Netherlands in, in about a month yeah. or so. Yeah, okay. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Um, uh, the uh, the Dutch national team is in, uh, in the World Cup this year. Uh, so I spend a lot of time watching and following that and trying to convince my son and daughter to, uh, to pick up soccer and, and follow it a little bit more. Um, yeah, other than that, uh, yeah. not a lot right now, just because of the, the four and the two year old. And my, I mean, I, I kind of think it's stable as my third child. Um, it is, it takes up a lot of your time, just like any job. Um, but even more so, I think when, you know, now it, the interesting thing is like, it was always really important to me now that we've started hiring people, we have investors, um, you know, it's, there's no turning back, right? Mm-hmm. You have to, if you're going to stop doing what you're doing, or if there's going to be a failure at some point, which we don't really think about. Um, it has to be uh, something that you really take seriously. And so, um, yeah, like I said, we, we don't really think about it. We are just like, we continue to drive forward and move forward because we have people that we need to pay now. We have investors that are expecting a return and, um, you know, we don't want to disappoint them. And so, yeah, I do, do kind of consider that my third child at this point. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, looking forward to seeing you in Amsterdam. That's DIA Amsterdam. And then I saw you just a few weeks ago in London for InsureTech Insights uh, Europe. Yeah. So, well, so I like see you in New York later this month, I'll have seen you in three countries in three months. I know. Yeah. Well, we are getting around a bit. Um, you know, to your point about how you like to kind of um, – uh, give back, mentor, or or create community within the space. You know, you have those those nice dinners that you do, lunches, um, where you get founders together, and that was yeah. that was great. Um, you know, there's there's no selling, there's no networking. It's more of just like honest conversations, kind of an opportunity to kick back a bit. Um, you you chose some very good wine, uh, and so uh, <laughs> yeah, want to thank you time. for that very nice lunch. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, that one was a lunch. Um, the one I did in uh, New York was a dinner. Um, I'll do another one in New York. Um, we talk about that offline. And you know, for the listeners, this is this is MGA CEOs only. And we um, 
just exchange it's the kind of things on this podcast we just exchange anecdotes and learnings and things like that i'm doing one in tel aviv next week and then of course back to new york um and i'd well, love to get one to get in amsterdam yeah and and i would say like um you know you guys do just general like you um you put that thing together um with tiffany wang uh, which i just downloaded the other mm -hmm. day uh, oh, yeah. that five page investment um you know kind of what what they're interested in what msnad is interested in um, so there's, a, I, I feel like, you know, there's obviously, you know, some content that you're creating, but there's a lot of value in that, that anybody can get just by kind of like signing up. Uh, and it's great to see, yeah. um, you guys giving back to the community in that way and trying to take some of the learnings or different investors you work with and try and provide value back. Um, I think that's a really good oh, thing. Thanks. It needs to continue. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I love it. And that was kind of the genesis of the podcast is I just, I talk to people like yourself and there's just so many so many learnings that should get out there so many stories that should get out there and um it's a it, it's a wonderful thing to um to to pay it forward um and then um one last thing speaking of soccer are you going to be at on ramp this year after two years in a football stadium and one in a basketball arena uh chicago and in, in minneapolis it's now at allianz field in minneapolis where the united play um are you going to make it up there for that I unfortunately will not. That's right around when we're oh. launching in Illinois, um, and it's it's our um, it's one of our attorneys. I was I was you know joking about our attorney. I love our attorney. He's great, great guy. Um, it's one of his favorite conferences, and he keeps telling me I need to go, and I've not made it yet. And so hopefully, twenty twenty three will be the year. But uh, it's a yeah, unique that, one. That looks like an amazing one. Yeah, I was reminded of it with all the um, because they're headed to soccer this year after. Uh, Football and basketball is their venue. It's always in a sports stadium, right? Yeah. Right. Um, well, that I mean, we're we're about at time. Um, thanks for taking the time to chat with me. This has really been fantastic. I think you've um, created some really great insights that I'm sure the listeners will love. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. I oh yeah. It. Last question I need to put out there: um, those listening, anything they can do to help? How can they learn more? Anything you're recruiting for? Yeah, so uh, we're always recruiting, I feel like. So happy to have a conversation with anybody um, that is looking for a new home, um, especially if they've spent time uh, in an incumbent, right? And they're, mm -hmm. they're not happy or they want to see things move a little bit faster. Um, I love having conversations just to figure out how we can work people into the organization, especially when there's, there's great talent and a lot of ambition. Um, yep. People can check us out on LinkedIn, uh, type in Stable Insurance, you'll find us. Um, I'm just Douglas Vermolm uh, on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, Stable INS, short for insurance.com is our, our website. Uh, you can sign up for our newsletter, um, company updates, things like that there. Uh, but yeah, generally the best place is to just follow us on LinkedIn. You'll kind of see what's going on uh, on our company page. So stableins.com, check it out. Uh, thank you for visiting today. Thanks, Dan.